just talking about his uh, education history. He, uh, he actually was a classmate of Ada Turk. Uh, no, only mm. uh, Tech uh, got his PhD from the University of Alberta in uh, 1980. He's been a database researcher uh, for many years, and, and for a number of years, he's uh, been heavily involved in bioinformatics research. And uh, today he'll talk about analyzing metabolomics data, which is a hard word to pronounce. Right. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start my talk, I should uh, really um, not take too much credit from this research. This is a research that I really like. Uh, but it's really mostly done uh, by my postdoc, Ali, who was my PhD student. Is Ali here? Oh, there you go. Raise your hand. There you go. And, um, and the idea originated from uh, Richard Hansen, who's a biochemist in our biochemistry department, an excellent researcher. Um, and, uh, and most of this research is really um, uh, cleaned and, uh, you know, uh, commented by uh, Richard Hansen. Arun, uh, who is now at Microsoft uh, in Seattle, uh, did the implementation of the system. Don't ask me what I have done. Uh, I just enjoyed myself. Uh, okay, so what is uh, uh, metabolomics? Um, metabolites are the molecules uh, that are uh, the products of your metabolism. And that metabolism, the, the way in which biochemists uh, Characterize this is you have a lipid metabolism, you have a carbohydrate metabolism, you have a, your body has a limited number of fuels, and they get uh, they get used. Uh, you have an energy metabolism, and so on. Uh, these uh, metabolites are the molecules that are involved in these uh, metabolic reactions. Metabolomy over here refers to the complete set of metabolites in a cell or in, in, in organs. And currently, uh, people classify about 2,500. Uh, I mean, it's not commonly agreed upon, approximately. Some people count more, some pe people count less. About 2,500 uh, metabolites. Metabolomics is the study of uh, the concentrations and the distributions of these metabolites, metabolomy. Uh, uh, so when you go to a lab, um, you get a blood test. Sometimes uh, you get a saliva test. Uh, sometimes you get a urine test. And, uh, and there are these uh, equipment, uh, and they, these equipment measure about 5 to 10 uh, metabolites in your blood. And then the doctor looks at those readings and uh, passes a judgment about, well, you have a little problem here, or you don't have any problems, you're OK, and so on. What has happened in, the recent, uh, in recent years is that there are these high energy physics equipment. Uh, they are expensive in the order of millions of dollars. Where these, through this equipment, uh, you can actually measure more than 5 to 10. You can measure 100 and up, these days, up to 200 metabolites in your blood. Now, uh, so that's great, right? Um, right now, Cleveland the Clinic does have uh, these equipment. And you can pay a lot, and they can actually give you a personalized health assessment. So the question is this. Um, when it's 5 to 10, doctors pretty much know which one of these metabolites are markers for what type of diseases or physiological conditions. They can tell you. They can pass a judgment. But the question is, when, when they go up to 100, now it's a, it's a difficult uh, question. Uh, if some of these metabolites, well, we know the normal values in, in, in a healthy person. When these measurements are different than normal values, what do they mean? This is the question. Uh, of course, the approach currently is even, uh, you know, even those who know biochemistry very well, even those MDs, actually go to an expert. Richard, Hans Richard Hansen, our, our colleague, is one of them. And, uh, and, and, and the way he tells me that he attacks this is, you know, you can't make sense out of these 500 uh, different measurements, or uh, not 500, 100 plus measurements. So he looks at 
a small number of them and tries to make sense out of it. Uh, this is how he works. Uh, so even for a biochemist who is an expert, Dr. Hansen is an expert in uh, metabolism. Uh, this, is, this is a tough, tough question. Uh, the metabolic network itself is too large. So biochemists really do not look at the whole network. It's too difficult to look at the whole network. They look at a subset, your energy metabolism, or your carbohydrate metabolism, uh, or your uh, a number of uh, metabolites related with uh, glycolysis, or the glucose uh, absorption and synthesis, etc. So out of that, they look at these measurements and try, they try to make sense out of it. Uh, of course, the real approach, the real approach that has to be done is to really mathematically model your metabolic network. Each reaction is, is controlled by a set of differential equations. Uh, and then understand uh, the interactions between these different reactions. And then by looking at these observations, pass a very precise analysis and give a very precise answer to people as to what, what's wrong with them if the, if, there are, if the measurements are not normal. This will not be done in my lifetime. I don't think this will be done in another 100 years. That's systems biology. So what is it that we can do? This is the question. Computationally, can we do anything? So here's an example. This example actually started with Ali. And Richard Hansen looked at it and said, no, no, no. This is not how I would do it. Change this. We change this and we change this. So now he, he, and he was satisfied. So in the blood, um, there are five metabolites that are observed. Glutamine is one of them. It has increased four folds from the regular uh, expected range. Alanine is another one, increased by two folds, uh, two fold. Urea, of course, uh, your body produces ammonia, which is poisonous. It has to be converted into urea. Uh, so uh, urea has, has decreased, that's not a good sign, by 0.5 fold in the blood. Uh, glucose has increased by 1.3 fold. And BCAA stands for branch chain amino acids. It has not changed. So these are the five measurements. Yes, ma'am. What is the variability of these amounts? I mean, when you say twofold, from is the it a very strict statement, or I mean? Yeah, so the expected range, the expected values are really, normal values are really ranges. I agree. So I have taken a liberty over here. Uh, saying that, let's say, you take the uh, upper bound of the normal range, and from the upper bound, it has increased by fourfold. Okay. So, uh, so what can possibly go wrong? So, uh, if you ask this question to a doctor, well, he will not be able to answer that. This is too difficult for an MD to be able to answer. So, you can go to uh, our expert, Dr. Hansen, Richard Hansen, and he would actually say, hey, I'll just pick one of them. Glutamine increase maybe because of four problems. Uh, within the muscle, there may be increased protein turnover. It's an external uh, process. Uh, within the liver, there may be increased production of glutamine, possibly signaling a problem with your urea cycle, a serious problem. Or there may be a decreased uptake of glutamine in kidney or, uh, or by gut. So, so then uh, he opens up his uh, atlas uh, and then looks at uh, this, uh, these four organs and the networks in here. Of course, we would like to visualize all of these. We can't visualize them like this now. This is too beautiful. Uh, but uh, we come close to it. We, we slowly come close to it. And this will happen, by the way. So over here, uh, so you see these. A, a green uh, a verse. This by itself is a subnetwork. It's a pathway. It's a set of uh, reactions. It's actually uh, uh, gluconeogenesis. Uh, urea cycle is another pathway that involves by itself a large number of reactions. So I took the liberty of taking a subnetwork and making it into a dotted line over here, dotted edge over here. That is really another subnetwork, metabolic network. But these are glutamate, uh, carbon dioxide, alpha ketoglutarate, alanine, etc. These are metabolites. And uh, the arrows, of course, indicate that uh, glutamate gets converted uh, into glutamine, uh, controlled by this enzyme, which is produced by a gene, of course. Uh, 
uh, glutamine synthetase, and so on. Uh, and this is blood. And in here, we, measured, we have measurements for five of these glucose. Urea, alanine, branch chain amino acids, uh, BCAA is another metabolite. Wait, why do we have this? I don't know why we have this. We, we, shouldn't, have, we shouldn't have had this. Uh, why do we have this in this visualization? Branch chain, with branch, this is branch chain keto acids. For this example, we don't really need this. We could have eliminated this, this, and this sub path over here. Glutamine, so we have five measurements over here. So we would like to, so, so what uh, Richard Hansen does is looks at this, only this sub-network within the metabolic network, and he wants, to try, he wants to verify or eliminate four of these different uh, possibilities, which we call them hypothesis. Um, so the cause of increasing glutamine concentration is due to hypothesis, H1, increased protein turnover in muscle, increased production by liver, problem in your urea cycle, decreased uptake by kidney decrease uptake by gut. Uh, so our research goal, of course, uh, is to capture the reasoning that Dr. Hansen follows, expand it into a larger environment. And we would like to do this, we would like to automate this whole process through uh, computer science techniques, through computational techniques. We would like to automate the interpretation of metabolic data via computational data analysis techniques. And in addition, in doing so, we would like to be able to answer questions that are more than just, hey, out of these four hypotheses, these are the bad ones. This, 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 this is a possibility. Continue further. So, so we would like to be able to answer questions like what may have led to the increase decrease in concentration of a metabolite, alternative hypothesis scenarios, consistency analysis of the, are these values consistent for this hypothesis or not? Actually, the hypothesis may use a sum, only a small number of metabolite changes, but it may not be consistent with these other observations. Andy. No, possibly not. You know, a patient comes, gives a blood, goes away, and then uh, the lab produces a report, and a doctor looks at it, uh, or a biochemist looks at it and says, you know, these are possible problems. You can't bring the patient again and again and again. Of course, it doesn't have to be blood. It can be saliva. It can be urine. It can be some other things. In, uh, you know, all sorts of possibilities, uh, you know, come to mind, but... Uh, Right now, we are only talking about you have this one-shot measurement. And then uh, what is it that we can do computationally to imitate a, an expert biochemist and even do more than what uh, an expert biochemist can do? That's what we are trying to do. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the, among the hypotheses that are possible, we call that M-valid hypothesis, I would like to be able to rank them and say, you know, this is more likely than this other one. Can I do something like that? In a, in a nice manner. And I would like to be able to relate these uh, uh, hypotheses to physiological conditions, possible diseases, or possible dietary problems, etc. So uh, what is it that we do? Yeah. Is there outcome data available? In other words, do you have, for these patients, do you, do you have data which characterizes their conditions? No, we, the only thing that we have is uh, right now, so far in this research, this research is just a beginning step. Uh, we published a paper, we wrote other papers, we are still working on yet more papers. We have a prototype, but you know, you can think, you can do lots of things. Right now we are just taking the first baby steps. Imagine a system like this at the hands of uh, MDs, everybody would use it. Uh, right now, only experts can do it, no computational techniques are available. Sets Maybe late. About past patients where you have all these measurements, plus you know in the end what Yeah, they okay. So there are sites actually that are beginning to appear. There is one effort in Canada. Uh, they call it HMDB database from Alberta, my alma mater. Uh, he has about $10 million effort in, in which he's making on the web. If you have this disease, then you would have these uh, abnormal values for these metabolites. But they are not at the level. Uh, of uh, analyzing them. They are getting these lab results and literature results and putting them into a database. We make use of those, actually. We download their data and use them. Anyway, so uh, what is it that we do? We have already, through another research, we have on the web 
A metabolic network database, this was actually our advantage. Um, we know how to capture, uh, visualize, make them available on the web. Uh, a metabolic database, uh, that was another research. And we are also using it for, other, for yet other research. But uh, we would, we, our approach is to use a metabolic network database and then build a software system that captures uh, the biochemistry knowledge more and more. Biochemistry is an amazing field. Metabolic biochemistry itself is an amazing field. Last semester I sat in a biochemistry course and this semester whenever I have the free time I keep reading, uh, trying to learn additional biochemistry, metabolic biochemistry. But we would like to learn and capture them computationally. Uh, and we would like to reason, we would like the software system to reason uh, like an expert metabolic bioexpert, biochemist, uh, except that, uh, as I said, uh, because of hu humanly limitations, even an expert biochemist focuses on sub-networks. The, the whole network is too large for uh, a person to digest and analyze. So uh, we, we, would like to we would like the software system to reason uh, uh, like an expert metabolic expert biochemist, Except that not at the level of, uh, not just at the level of a metabolic, metabolic sub-network, but the whole network, if there's a reason. Actually, under certain conditions, it does make sense to only look at a small number of uh, pathways or sub-network and reason with it. Actually, we, we are working along those directions as well. Uh, this is a higher level goal. In reality, the very first step uh, that a software system should do is to imitate a biochemist and then, and then do more than what a biochemist can do. Of course, uh, uh, I'm really giving you the, uh, the, uh, the, the larger scope over here. So what is uh, today's talk? Uh, I may actually run out of time, so then I will just summarize at the end. Uh, the essence of it, in terms of computer science, we are all computer scientists over here. Uh, I'm not going to give you, you know, <laughs> remarks and theorems and proofs and models and so on. That's not the goal here. Uh, computationally, what do we do in terms of computer science? What we do is we, we, we have designed a chase process within the network. If this metabolite has increased, it's because this has decreased or this has increased and then now that I have derived this, if this has decreased, then this has increased, this has decreased. Keep chasing the implications of whatever you have observed. Make sense out of it. Eliminate as much as possible uh, hypotheses in the overall network. Uh, and then whatever you cannot eliminate, they may or may not be valid. Give them to the expert. So essentially, this is the idea. This is what we are trying to do. So we would like to computationally generate a set of hypotheses. Each, each, each set is a set of metabolite concentration changes. Some of them are observed, some of them are derived. Uh, that are maybe valid, we call them invalid. And we would like this to be, of course, as small as possible. And that are invalid. Uh, we, in, a, in, a, in a regular metabolic network, there are about 150 pathways in human beings, let's say. We, we have a prototype system in which we have about 50 pathways. With 50 pathways, uh, with about 30 observations, the number of hypotheses that you generate are about 200,000. Imagine that if you go up to uh, 150 pathways, it will be in millions. And the length of these hypotheses are huge. But we, with, with a sm much smaller, 34, really not 100, 34 observations, we were able to eliminate about, uh, you know, out of 140,000 or so, I'll show you the uh, information, experimental information. We go down to about uh, 100 to 200, right, Ali? 100 to 200 hypotheses. Even that is too much. And then not only that, our hypotheses are, are too large. We have to be able to say that, look, this, this is a hypothesis that may be valid. It's about 50 metabolite observations or 60, 70. It's long. The possible causes for this can be this, this, and this. This is what we would like, eventually, our system to be able to do. Yeah. Is that how the expert does it? No. Chase type of thing? Absolutely not. So that's exactly the point. It, 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 Dr. Hansen, what he actually said, I have the notion of a pattern, he said. It took me a long time to figure that out. You know. What is he talking about by a pattern? Essentially, what he's really saying, he has three, four uh, 
different than normal observations for three, four metabolites. And then he immediately, his mind immediately clicks. These abnormal ones are because I know there is a problem in liver. Liver, of course, is the most complex organ with tons of uh, pathways, metabolic pathways in it. I know there is a problem in, uh, in kidney, etc. And then he focuses more and more on that. Even with that, uh, two of them come together, they don't disagree, you know, they don't agree. He, he, this one says, no, no, no. But look at this, this one doesn't, means that possibly there's a problem over here. It's, it's an art form, it's not really completely uh, finished yet, because it's essentially, uh, what you need is a systematic elimination of uh, possibilities, something that a computer system would do very well. Okay, so uh, this, this was the example uh, uh, metabolic network with four organs and then uh, we have these we have these four hypotheses I'm sorry I have to go back a little bit this the order is messed up these are the four hypotheses we would like to invalidate or am validate these hypotheses uh, so uh, so this is also hand drawn we have something similar to this not as beautiful as this uh, and we're working on improving it so uh, glutamine, GLN over here is glut glutamine over here. Glutamine is observed in the blood to increase. Okay, so the other thing that we do is we are not, we, our technology is not at a level where we actually use the actual observation, observed values. Uh, all we can tell is that this, this is greater than the normal value or this is less than the normal value. Uh, this is what we could do. Uh, you know, we cannot do anything more than that with the current technology and knowledge available. Glutamine in blood is increase, has increased, has, is more than, uh, it's a perturbation, it's more than the normal value. It's because uh, glutamine in muscle, assuming that uh, the transport is not, transport from uh, muscle, to muscle to blood is, is, is unconditional, which is the case in glutamine. In some cases, there are sophisticated mechanisms where the transports are gated, are controlled. Very complicated. Uh, but glutamine in, blo in blood has increased. It's because glutamine in muscle has increased. It's because uh, glutamine is produced by a reaction that uses glutamate. Uh, glutamate over here has increased. And this can only happen because branch chain amino acids has increased. But this cannot happen. We have observed that uh, our observation said that branch chain amino acid levels did not change. So therefore, protein turnover cannot be possible. Uh, it has not happened, so hypothesis H1 is invalid. This is exactly how we work. This is all we use. Going back, uh, glutamine has increased in blood. Uh, it's caused by the transportation of glutamine from muscle, this is muscle, to the blood. It, it's, it's not gated, as I told you. Glutamine is produced by this reaction, this enzyme, uh, using glutamate as a, a substrate, as an input, substrate is an input, using this uh, enzyme. Glutamate uh, is produced uh, using this reaction, transaminase, uh, using BCAA, branch chain amino acid, as, as a substrate, as input. But branch chain amino acids uh, cannot, did not increase because in the blood, I have observed normal levels of branch chain amino acids. So Protein turnover is not a problem for this person. This is exactly this is exactly how we work. I think I need to go a little bit faster. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. I'm curious as to how you encode the rules. We have a lot of very nice rules here, but No, no, we don't have rules so, so far. There are no rules. Just the whole network, we have a network. Uh, we have the reactions. The reactions are defined by inputs and they produce output. If an input increases, output increases. This is, what all I, this is all I use. Uh, and this is when the reaction. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I is that on? Oh, my microphone. All right. Okay, but let me continue and then we'll, uh, we'll take this offline. I, I am sorry about this. Okay, so uh, you can see that. Uh, Glutamine in blood has increased because glutamine in the liver has increased because ammonia and H3 has increased. Uh, but this, this can happen because, uh, because of decrease in urea. And this is a possible hypothesis. We could not eliminate it. We call this an M valid, maybe valid, not necessarily valid, maybe valid hypothesis. Let's go back. Um, 
Glutamine over here ha has increased uh, and uh, um, and we are discussing liver coverage over here. Uh, glutamine increase in liver has occurred occur because glutamine is, is produced more and released to the blood. Uh, if glutamine is produced more because this reaction over here uh, has more uh, ammonia uh, production and HTP production and that cause more glutamine and that cause uh, more glutamine in liver and more glutamine in blood. Uh, but ammonia increase can happen because ammonia is an input uh, to this uh, pathway, subnetwork, urea cycle. Uh, if urea cycle d does not use enough ammonia, ammonia would increase and then it would uh, trigger glutamine increase in blood eventually. So uh, if this cycle is not working, ammonia is not utilized, urea is produced less and uh, you would measure less urea in the blood. And this is exactly what we have observed, less urea in the blood. So this hypothesis, we say it's a maybe hypothesis, and it, I cannot, uh, my system cannot eliminate this hypothesis. Going forward, you can uh, use exactly the same reasoning to, 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 to eliminate this hypothesis. There is no problem in kidney, and there is no problem in uh, gut. So this is the essence. Uh, so uh, I said this already. I'm going to skip this. And I said this already. I will skip this. I should. Uh, I should clean up these uh, slides. I, of course, I always revise these at the last minute. Uh, and just before coming here, I was revising them. OK, uh, I'll skip these. So this is, of course, the one used by biochemists is a limited approach, necessarily limited, because they want to contain their analysis. Uh, there are a bunch of hypotheses that they formulate first, and then they eliminate them. In reality, why, why uh, define these hypotheses? Why just look at all possible uh, uh, M-valid uh, hypotheses across the whole network? Eliminate all hypotheses, either in the whole network or its carefully chosen subnetwork, involving a small number of pat metabolic pathways, and then eliminate hypotheses that are invalid, and rank and list the ones uh, that are M-valid. That's our goal. So I'm not going to talk about ranking and so on. Uh, the paper discusses all of those. Uh, our good friend, uh, Dr. Hansen, calls them crap. He doesn't believe our computational ranking techniques. Uh, uh, so I won't discuss that. And when we did this, I said, Ali, this is great. Uh, this is a great computational technique to rank them. He looked at them. I'm using the word crap. He used something else. Uh, that, was, that was less complimentary. Anyway, so this is, uh, I haven't so far talked about the notion of a reaction. A metabolite is produced through a reaction, and the reaction is catalyzed. Its speed is carefully controlled by an enzyme. An enzyme is a gene product. Therefore, a gene is expressed to produce that enzyme. Uh, this metabolite is produced, is, 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 is a substrate or input. Substrate is the word for input. Uh, to this reaction, uh, catalyzed by this enzyme, and producing this output, we call it a product. This is a substrate, this is a product, and this whole thing is a reaction over here, and catalyzed by enzyme. This is a simpler, simpler uh, version of the reality. In reality, this enzyme itself uh, is, is regulated, activated, and inhibited by other uh, other uh, metabolic uh, uh, molecular entities, and therefore it's, this is more complex than that. But this is enough for the time being. Uh, we call these two as co-input or co-substrates to this reaction, because you need both of them for this enzyme to produce M5. Okay. Uh, so there is this terminology over here. Uh, we say that M2 over here is upstream. Uh, of M6, and M6 is downstream of M2. M4 is uh, immediate upstream of M6. So that you can think of this as uh, uh, these molecules are flowing through this network. You can think of it like that. And therefore, you can use the notion of upstream and downstream, and immediately upstream, and immediately downstream, and so on. Although I don't think I took out all the slides that refer to this uh, terminology use. OK. so. Uh, so we have these observed events in the blood. 
it doesn't have to be blood. I'm just using it as an example. It can be uh, urine, it can be saliva, it can be skin uh, fluids. It can be anything. Uh, two, year, two hours after the treatment with a certain drug X, the level of M4 has decreased, has increased by twofold, while the level of M5 has not changed in patient's blood. So uh, this, we call these superscript or refers to an observed event. Of course, we number them. Uh, and then this is the metabolites 4 and 5. This has not changed. This has increased. We don't use this information, th the fact that twofold it should be. We don't use the information that this is increased by twofold. We simply say that uh, M4 has increased okay, in our analysis. Although if we had a way of using the actual increases, it would have been much better, of course. Uh, we use derived events. These are the ones. Uh, in our in other words, derived observation derived uh, increases or changes of metabolites that are not in the blood or that are not measured by my equipment. Uh, these are we call these observed events. No, implied by observed events. We call these derived events. They involve metabolites that cannot be measured in the blood, and or perhaps they are not they are not of interest and they are not measured in the blood. We distinguish them with the superscript D, derived event. So the characterization is essentially this. This is the basic rule that we use. Uh, if, a, if a metabolite is observed to increase, it's produced by this reaction. And this substrate uh, is used to, to produce this uh, enzyme. And I observe that this has decreased uh, in the blood. Uh, if this has decreased, because this this input has decreased in size. So I can go backward and say that this has decreased. This is, what, this is a derived observation. Or if this has decreased, then possibly it's consumed more in the next reaction. Uh, because this has decreased, it's produced less or consumed more in the next reaction. This is the essence of it. You can, this is the inverse of this. If you have observed to increase, exactly the same process, reasoning applies. So this is the causality analysis. Essentially, I'm using only this causality analysis for this discussion. I mean, isn't that only true if, if, if you've done these perturbations in a randomized controlled trial? No, 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 no. The reactions are such that in your body, our body is an amazing mechanism, biological mechanism. You produce more substrate, it will produce more even that everything else stays are the same. You already know the causal mechanism here, or are you trying to infer? No, no, no. I know the causal mechanism. I, need, I have the network. Right. I have the network. I will chase the, these uh, increases and decreases in the network. One of the things that we had, an, we had the advantage is that we had the database of the network before coming into this research. So the, I will distinguish three different types of causality analysis. Uh, the one that I just mentioned to you. Uh, if, this has, if this is observed to increase, then perhaps in this reaction it's produced more. This is observed to increase. Or if this is observed to in increase, it's not consumed. So therefore, uh, this one over here that will be produced through this reaction uh, is, is, is produced less. This is only the reasoning that we have. This is the substrate in this causality. Of course, this metabolite, together with this other metabolite, may produce this other metabolite through this reaction. In other words, these, these two are input to this reaction. This is the one that I observe to increase. If, it, if this has increased, probably because this has decreased, and these two together are not consumed enough in this reaction. So this is the so-called co-substrate in this causality. And then what I call over here reaction rate control event in this causality is huge. Obviously, we have to model them one by one, uh, but we, don't ha we have not done it yet. What do I mean by reaction rate control event? Um, RRC stands for reaction rate control. It can, it can involve other metabolites that are regulators of the enzyme, the reaction itself. Uh, they can be inhibitors, activators, uh, or, it, or it, they can be actually actual enzyme expression rate changes, or that and that corresponds to gene expression rate changes. And it can be regulated by sophisticated mechanisms. Of course, we capture all of these and say, call them RRC controlled events. Uh, you can see that we are really at the beginning of all this uh, modeling and analysis. Uh, so the other causality analysis is that the minute you observe one metabolite to increase, like if this M1 has increased, 
There is this forward cascading effect. We call it a forward cascading e effect. If this is produced more, it, immediate, it will immediately produce, cause M2 produce more, M4 produce more, M6 produce more. You don't need the, uh, the previous first type of causality analysis for this. We call this causality analysis of type 2. Uh, and then the third type of causality analysis, your body actually takes uh, certain metabolites by consumption through dietary intake. And if, you, if your dietary intake changes, then the concentration levels of some of these metabolites change because they are actually, so your body doesn't produce these metabolites. They can only be consumed by food di through dietary intake. So essential amino acids are actually amino acids that your body needs. It doesn't produce. It needs it through, through diet. Uh, so we need to capture this. In addition, of course, as I said, there are physiological processes. And if these uh, physiological processes uh, change, then the concentration levels of metabolites change, such as the protein turnover in muscle that I described. So we have to capture these, uh, these third type as well. The way in which we capture this is essentially a, 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 a tryptophan, for instance, is, a, is produced uh, uh, in blood through dietary intake. This is the rule that we use, actually. This is an example of a rule. Or we, uh, we provide this to our system. Uh, uh, alanine uh, is produced in muscle through protein turnover. Okay. So we need these rules to capture the third type of uh, causality rules. Yeah, Josh. Is this the way he does it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. No question about that. Uh, so, for instance, obviously, it doesn't take a genius to understand that uh, uh, if the calcium is absorbed in the bone, then obviously it's going to decrease in blood. Uh, we should say calcium decrease over here. If the dietary intake of calcium uh, uh, increase, uh, increases, and it, then it will increase in blood as well, I guess. I didn't say it the right way. Did I say it right, well? I guess you need to push the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just skipping them. I will, form, I will characterize it. This, these are all simplifications, because otherwise there are, there's too much notation. Uh, now, we, we have to define a conflict, right? I des described the conflict in, in which the analysis led me to say that branch chain amino acids must increase in blood but there was no change in blind chain amino acids. That's a conflict, right? So we characterize it as uh, observed is not right over here. The same metabolite is observed or derived to increase in one event and decrease in another. That obviously constitutes a conflict. It cannot have happened, right? One of them is an observation, or both of them are, are, uh, are uh, derived events. Either way. Josh, you have a question? Maybe? Yeah. Okay, so this is a simplified definition of conflict. Conflict involves a little bit more than this, but you, you, you get the idea. So uh, this is also hand drawn. Uh, this should go down, shouldn't it? Uh, there you go. And this is your mistake. Uh, I was wondering why my slides were chopped off. Uh, Mehmet. What is the difference between a derived event and cascading event? No, the, uh, events are either observed or derived through our rules, through our, uh, uh, through our three different types of rules. Uh, and uh, cascading event is just, uh, you don't really use uh, uh, the um, you know, produce less or consume uh, more reasoning. You simply say that within this subnetwork, if this is the source of all these molecules, then obviously if this increases, all of them will increase. So cascading event, uh, only event follows. The reasoning, yes. Follows event. the very first reasoning. Right. But the derived event is something that might result in the given event. Right, it's right. exactly. The exactly. Event. Exactly. OK, so, so this is, uh, uh, so, the, so we, s we can start with only one observation. And from that, we can look at all the derived events and that we can define a closure tree. This is an example of a closure tree. M4 is the observed event. M4 is observed to increase. And by using this network over here, we can come up with this all possible implications of this increase. Like, for instance, this one over here, M4 is, has increased. 
it's, uh, it's caused by M2, uh, increase in M2. M4 has increased because M2 has increased. And then I'm just following this because M1 has increased. And it, this, the increase of M1 may be because of dietary intake. This, this, this symbol represents increase in dietary intake. And this is a possibility. But this, this path over here is not possible. M4 is increased because M2 has increased, because M1 has increased. And M1 is, has, has increased because M2 has decreased. You can, you can have that reasoning. Uh, the, the, the decrease of M2 would increase M1. Uh, but that cannot be possible. Uh, we've, we've already observed that M2 has increased. So this is an invalid path over here. Uh, by using this reasoning, you can come up with a closure tree, all possible hypotheses. At the leaf level, you can look at the conflicts or uh, consistency with, what, with the observations, and then decide whether that root to leaf path, which we call it a hypothesis, is valid or invalid or invalid. Uh, we do produce this, actually, but what we produce because of the size of the network is not as beautiful as this. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, so it's that uh, this, this path over here corresponds to this path over here. Uh, so there is a notion of consistent event set. I said this already. Uh, if the same uh, metabolite is derived as increased here than decreased here, of course, they are not consistent. And if you, in this path, if you observe this, th that this metabolite has increased, and in another path, if you observe that the same metabolite has increased, it's not minimal. It's, uh, it's not a minimal event set. So there is a notion of consistency and minimality. With these two, we can define the hypothesis, which we, I already said this. Given a single observed event, the root of my closure tree and its closure tree, hypothesis is a root to leave consistent and minimal path P within the closure tree. You agree with me, right? Uh, or are you lost already? Yeah, Bill. One little minor issue, and that is, you talk about increase, so forth and so forth, but we don't mention time constants. And no. In, oh, so in one of my very, very old researches, we did just that, looking at what input at absolutely time and how long you saw the response. Right. And I agree. A peaking response, which means I agree. You couldn't, you couldn't nail down a particular amplitude or level. I agree. You know what time. I absolutely agree with you. This is a snapshot. That's one yet crit one more critique that you are referring to. Now, now, now you have to look into time series analysis, how quickly metabolites are uh, produced, the pool sizes, and so on. I haven't said anything that this is fully faithful to biochemistry. Actually, it's not faithful to biochemistry, basic biochemistry, in many ways. And one by one, we are working on uh, additional techniques and rules to capture these additional uh, uh, biochemistry rules and then put them into our system. I will list them. There are, there's a long list of uh, reasoning uh, or uh, biochemistry knowledge that we don't capture. OK. That's why I said this is the beginning. But it's nowhere to be found. This is the only place that uh, nobody else has done this. Yes? Will you define minimal it means the minimal length of a path? No, mi no, minimal, I said, not minimum. Minimal. Uh, minimal, minimal event set. Uh, minimal in the sense that uh, the path doesn't have uh, uh, the same metabolite uh, occurring twice, exactly oh. the same direction. Oh. Oh. That would be redundant, right? It's essentially yeah. a notion it's, of it's redundancy. Path no, 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 no. It's a simple path. Right. Yeah. yeah, I guess, yes. So, um, so each one of these uh, root to leaf paths are hypotheses. The green ones are invalid ones, and the red ones are invalid uh, hypotheses. Uh, this is an example of that. Uh, so uh, our problem is now we can formulate our problem. Given an organism, uh, oops, an organism, sorry about that. And by that, we usually mean mammalians, OK? I mean. Uh, Really, by that, we usually mean humans. Uh, given an organism and a set OE of observed events, these are the ones that are measured in blood, let's say, compute the set of all uh, distinct hypotheses derivable from the uh, set of observed events. This is the problem. Uh, of course, uh, we have not said anything about 
how metabolites are transported from one organ to another or from one organ to blood uh, and uh, the, the, the transport mechanism. Uh, for the time being, we, we only use a very simple uh, transport mechanism. If, uh, if, if uh, a metabolite is observed to increase in blood and it's used in this organ, then it gets transported immediately. Uh, or uh, and, and vice versa. So the rules that we have are simple rules, but in reality, as I said, these rules have to be more complex in some cases because glucose do doesn't get transported uh, freely from blood. It needs insulin as a gate. It's gated by insulin. Uh, and the other thing is uh, these reactions. Let's say arginine. Arginine is a metabolite. It's consumed uh, is a substrate or input to transaminase and arginase reactions, these two, these two enzymes. Uh, but this reaction consumes more of arginine, most of the arginine. Uh, and this reaction over here consumes much less of arginine. Through decades of research, this is available to biochemists. Uh, they know this. Like in muscles, ammonia amounts in muscles are, in muscle is very small. So therefore, ammonia production uh, I don't want to go back to our uh, big drawing. You see that there is an ammonia production, but it's minimal. Therefore, really, the productivity of a certain reaction occurs in this uh, product, uh, in this molecular entity, rather than this one over here. We can capture that with these. We call this flux ratio uh, scores. And by using flux ratio scores, I can say that this is much more likely. The score is 0.9. Uh, whereas this is much less likely, the score is uh, smaller, 0.1 versus 0.9. And through this reasoning, we rank them. This is, of course, correct. Um, there is no problem. Richard Hansen, Dr. Hansen agrees with this, but there are other things that we use. He wasn't agreeing with them. Uh, so I'll go through the experimental evaluation very quickly in a couple of minutes, and then I'll ex explain the limitations of our approach and what we are really doing right now. So uh, we have a test-based system. I don't know if you will have time to discuss this. Uh, using 34 uh, uh, metabolite observations, uh, we have about 50 pathways, 241 reactions. Process is a reaction. Uh, 205 metabolites, uh, nine tissues. Uh, I will skip these uh, for the time being. Uh, and these are the 34 measurements. Uh, uh, the, the, number of, uh, the number of hypotheses that's generated is close to 130,000, you can see. 130,000 of them are invalidated. Uh, the length of the hypothesis keeps increasing. You can see that we have invalid hypotheses that include 74 different metabolite increases and decreases. That's, of course, too long, right? Uh, in terms of the elimination, most of the elimination occurs because of a conflict with observed events. No, conflict with ancestors, and then duplicates or conflict with observed events uh, are also causes for elimination of invalidating hypotheses. And uh, this is a good one. Uh, the number of hypotheses uh, uh, of length, uh, the, the, well, when the number of observations is one, of course, we have 100,000 hypotheses. As the number of observations increase, uh, the, the, the number of invalidated, no, this, not, this doesn't make sense. The number of validated, invalidated hypotheses, it should be. The number of invalidated hypotheses, of course, keeps decreasing. And eventually, we have 95% reduction in the total no number of hypotheses with about 40 major metabolite changes. These are some results that we had. There are, there are others in the paper. Uh, if you create the data randomly, actually, then, uh, uh, of course, then you will have a better performance. Uh, ultimately, the number of observations go down to 300 over here with this one. In other words, what I'm saying is that in the closure tree, you can have 140,000 hypotheses, but using our techniques, we can invalidate most of them, 95%, with random data, 99%. Uh, we go down to about 200, 300 hypotheses. So but it's still too large. 200, 300 hypotheses to be interpreted by uh, biochemists is still too large. So being able to eliminate more is better, of course. Random, 
data is because, because of redundancy in the real measurements. Because data is random, right. No, the real measurements are more biased in terms of the behavior of the network. Yeah. Uh, so we actually applied this to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We have a report on that. Uh, and we could actually, we could, ha we could interpret the results through the hypothesis. We could locate really the interpretations of disease problems. Uh, we could locate them in the hypotheses that are generated. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is too, too much detail. Uh, we built this system. Uh, we had a system, as I said, we have a path case system on the web. It's available for everybody. It's being used. We use it for other research as well. We changed it into a metabolomics tool. Arun implemented this under the guidance of Ali. So we can supply to the system, uh, upload the observations uh, using a file that you provide over here. It's an XML file that you provide over here. And the system, uh, and then you pick which one metabolite as uh, the root observed, uh, at the root of a closure tree. Then it actually immediately lists the uh, hypotheses that are M validated. Of course, invalidated ones are eliminated. It lists the hypotheses that are M validated for you through this tool over here, through this interface. You can do it on the web. You can submit to it, and then it will tell you these are the ones that are possibly, that may be valid. Uh, so, uh, or you can actually use a sample observation file that we provided, and it will do the work for you. Of course, uh, the number of hypotheses may be, it may be many. So uh, uh, you can enter them one by one. Number of observations, uh, you can enter them one by one. And the number of hypotheses, uh, sometimes we say, the user can say, give me only the top 10 hypotheses rather than uh, all 300, whatever, something close to that. Uh, so these are, uh, so this is, this, this is a possible uploaded data. These are the observed changes, pyruvate, glycocholate, glutamate, et cetera. Uh, and then, uh, and then the, the result, uh, the level one and level two models are different types of models. One is more sophisticated than other. I haven't had the time to ex ex describe that. And this is the uh, closure tree expanded up to 15, and then the resulting hypotheses are produced over here. You can save these hypotheses to disk. Uh, these are the ranking scores that we have over here. These are the ones. And we have different types of ranking scores, coverage-based, implication-based. These are different techniques, as I said. Not, very, not liked much by Dr. Hansen. And then this is what we produce as closure tree. It's, of course, huge. Um, this is the root over here. You can see the expansions. It keeps expanding to the left and to the right, to the point that I realized that these visualizations are not useful. They are too large. Uh, we have to do something else. You, you, this, is, this is literally what we can visualize at this point. Uh, this is uh, the Cori cycle. Cori cycle is a subnetwork in the metabolic network. It's a pathway. It uh, occurs in muscle, bus, uh, blood, and liver. Uh, you see the cycle. We visualize it like this. this. You can change this. You can move this around, and then freeze it and save it to your uh, hard disk, and then revisualize it later on. We, we produce this through other things, through other research anyway. We just adopted it. Uh, so the conclusion is that this is a tool that does consequence. I call it, cons we call it, I don't know, I call it consequence prediction. prediction. Doesn't sound uh, like a right name, but at any rate, uh, uh, what are the limitations? It does not really utilize exact amounts. Can't do much about it now. We, I mean, we don't have a way of using the actual amounts. If you need to use the actual amounts, you need to you have a very precise model, systems biology model, and we don't have it. It's not available. We can't do it. Uh, it's not really fully faithful to the underlying biology. We are working on it. Like uh, all of these additional uh, metabolic mechanisms that control pathways uh, are not captured uh, and inserted into our model. We are working on them one by one. All of these are detailed uh, information, really, uh, to, for me to be able to elaborate on them. It will take more time and need more biochemistry knowledge. Uh, it's not in line with how biochemists analyze uh, active and inactive metabolic paths for different metabolisms. We are working on it. In reality, this is exactly what Dr. Hansen uses in his course, actually. I attended his course. Uh, you see, this is a bunch of pathways, a subnetwork. This glycolysis, gluconeogenesis. Uh, some of them are just uh, simplified. Fatty acid synthesis, uh, and, and so on. Beta oxidation, ketone body synthesis, and essentially, the way in which he emphasizes, under these conditions, 
Uh, the bold face paths are the active ones. The other ones are inactivated uh, for various reasons. Uh, and then he goes through this reasoning. Like this is, uh, this is not active, but this is very active uh, within gluconeogenesis. And then he reasons through this because there is a rate controlling reaction or step over here <coughs> and so on. This is how he uses. We should be able to produce this as well. How do you know they're inactive? Uh, because, of the, because of the given conditions. The, given condition. okay. Okay. the state yeah. of the, uh, in yeah. this case, I think, the, I, <coughs> I think in this case, the state of the uh, ketone bodies are produced more. So this is, must be a, a body state, uh, a dietary state of uh, uh, fasting state. Uh, you, you, your body has a bunch of fuels, and it, use, it switches from one fuel to another. If there is glucose, it uses it. If there is no glucose, it uses the fat in your body, converts it into ketone uh, bodies, and then you, uh, your brain starts using ketone bodies after fasting enough many days. Uh, and then he uses his reasoning to, f to discuss what's happening in the network. And I should be able to do that too. My system should be able to do that too, with enough information. Uh, so uh, we are working on this, and actually, eventually, what we would like is actually provide all this information is in a SQL-like language, a database-like query language, and then the system will spit out uh, this. So here is an example of that. With respect to the previous example, select all paths from these pathways: glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, TCA cycle, da 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 da. -da. Use only the compartments. Of course, your body is highly compartmentalized. Uh, certain reactions occur in uh, mitochondria, certain reactions occur, occur in cytosol, etc., etc. So uh, specify, the, specify what it is that you would like to use, which compartments you want to use, cytosol in liver, mitochondria and cytosol in liver. The dietary state, specify the dietary state, specify the concentration changes that you have observed, and then also specify where the, which pathways are you talking about, which compartments, because pathways change from compartment to compartment. This is the information. And then these are the observations. The state is fasting state. And I want you to visualize only these three pathways, uh, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, and TCA cycles. The others, uh, don't visualize them. Just uh, you know, represent them as a single edge. And also explain what's being blocked and what's not being blocked. We'll spit out this. It's not like we, we do this now. This is my goal that I will have this query language, it will run, and it will process the query, and then it will spit this out. But this is what, this, this is what we would like to achieve eventually. These are future research. Uh, uh, all of these are future research uh, topics. I finished. I, I, I have a couple of questions. Maybe I can take a couple of questions. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. seem like you, the, the, the models you have are, would be a nice basis for creating a probabilistic graphical models like Bayesian networks or, or classification trees, on the other hand. I assume yeah. the reason you're not using those kinds of models is there's a lack of confirmed diagnoses for these patients. In other words, you don't have good labels for the for the hypotheses for a large set of patients where you have the measurements and you know the outcome? No, you know what? Those models are used yeah. for disease-related uh, environments because uh, 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 metabolomics researchers actually do that. They never do this uh, because this is basic stuff. Uh, what they do is if there is <laughs> cancer, probabilistically, which paths are more likely paths that are being expressed. What is happening in the network? And the, 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 I, I have seen many papers along those lines, yes. Uh, highly in-depth in biochemistry. Uh, but, uh, but this is really the very first step. Uh, the you, probabilistic you analysis. That data, wouldn't you like to give probabilities to those hypotheses, though? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I agree with you. But uh, in a network of uh, 5,000 reactions, you know, uh, whatever, uh, uh, 2,500 uh, metabolites, too many reactions. It's difficult to come up with probabilistic analysis. But eventually, that may happen. Eventually, that may happen. Uh, so I don't know whether you did some experiment like this. Uh, when you have those, a set of hypotheses, uh, it cannot be invalidated. Uh, can you actually 
uh, overlay those uh, handles uh, with the uh, network to see which part actually might, uh, um, uh, which which um, set of edges actually might contain uh, in many of those. You can do that. Remember that I didn't tell you that actually I had a single closure tree with a certain chosen observed metabolite. If I choose this, if I choose this, if I choose this, mm -hmm. the intersection may eliminate more hypotheses. Right, right. But this is a computationally expensive process. It's, a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a uh, exponential time process. So, uh, so those type of things can be done. We haven't come to those yet. We are still trying at the very basic level of modeling more, modeling more, and being more faithful to the bio biochemistry, more faithful to the biochemistry. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Just one quick. Do you know if anyone is uh, trying to map uh, mitochondrial DNA expression to these uh, metabolomes? It, well, it has to be done within the context of a certain research, right? It may have been done with, by, uh, for, for you know, cancer researchers and so on. The field is large. Uh, I attended a conference, uh, and there were so many different types of research. Uh, so it is possible, but I don't really know, to be honest with you. All I know is that they hardly use uh, any computer science uh, or data management or network analysis techniques. They just don't know. Uh, they, they, they don't have enough computer scientists getting into this area. Uh, which will, I think, change, especially with these health initiatives and additional money about. You can take this and make this in into, you know, what's wrong with the dietary problems of normal individuals? And then it becomes a health informatics research. Thank you.